many had recently returned from operations abroad. With just two weeks of rehearsals, some understandably felt the pressure of expectation as they boarded trains at 3 a.m. to make their way to London. But all nerves were instantly vanquished at 1.08 p.m. when, with the echo of SGT Maj Stokes order the coronation procession, by the centre, quick march still reverberating off the Portland stone edifices, they set off to the strains of coronation bells as it played at a tempo of 108 beats per minute. Just a week ago one of the coronation procession's chief architects, LTCO James Shaw of the Grenadier Guards, took a moment from heavy, pavement-pounding rehearsals to confide, the one thing we don't want is rain, rain would be annoying, we want a lovely, sunny day. But there was little chance of overcast skies diminishing the splendor of the Golden State coach as it made its way slowly, pulled by its eight Windsor Grey horses. Ensconced within, next to Queen Camilla, the newly crowned king became only the eighth monarch to occupy the 263-year state coach which, though it wasn't quite ready in time for the coronation of George III who commissioned it, has been used for every coronation since that of William IV in 1831. Naughty coronation drum horse goes rogue with viewers asking can he moonwalk? Prince Harry's car spotted at Heathrow as he dashes home to see Archie and Meghan. Heroic Penny Mordaunt leaves viewers in awe of her strength with magnificent sword roll. It was unknown if staff at the Royal Muse repeated the kindness they had bestowed on Queen Elizabeth II in 1953, by placing hot water bottles under the velvet upholstered seat to offset an unseasonably cold June day but if King Charles and Queen Camilla felt any discomfort in the notoriously joint-jarring coach, they did not show it. Because of its weight, the Giltwood Golden State coach can only achieve walking pace, and it fell to Captain Angus Wood, of the Blues and Royals, to ensure the procession ahead kept pace. Mounted on his steed, Quetta, he achieved this with subtle but pre-coordinated movements of his sword which others had been trained to look out for. With the procession snaking back a full mile from LTCOL Shaw's position to the last farrier who carried the rear, messages were delivered just as subtly from group to group. Given a remarkably blank sheet, LTCOL Shaw procession CO planner SGT Major Stokes had poured over YouTube footage of the 1953 coronation for inspiration. And they got it with the idea of increasing the width of foot guards, normally just six across, to the 15 across of the last coronation. We decided to make the procession as wide as possible so that it's packed with troops and color, he said. It produces a wonderful spectacle of color and I suppose grandeur as well, that I think the country likes to see and we want to show. The burst of red, gold, black, white and blue of foot guards and cavalry uniforms were supplemented by those carrying out seemingly archaic roles that lay bare a centuries-old historical thread. Immediately surrounding the state coach, the royal barge master and waterman represent the 700 years from 1215 when the monarch travelled along the River Thames by royal barge. Also flanking the coach were the yeoman jailer, yeoman warders, members of the Royal Company of Archers, the monarch's bodyguards in Scotland, the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms, eight grooms and six palace footmen. Leading the gold state coach was Major General Chris Geeka commanding the household division, who also served as the joint military commander for the military response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the funerals of their majesties the Duke of Edinburgh and Queen Elizabeth II. An outer circle was provided by 18 representatives of the realms. Directly behind rode Princess Anne on her Mount Falkland. Performing her role as gold stick in waiting, she was the only other member of the royal family to take part in the prose.